My name is Brian Volkweiss. Uh, I'm the founder of the Nacelle Company. And uh, 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 other than maybe the first five years of my life, I'm a lifelong Trekkie. And, um, you know, the, the BCAD moment for this company was the show we do for Netflix called The Toys That Made Us. Mm -hmm. And after that show came out, um, people just started trusting us to make certain types of content. So the other thing I should mention, as you may be aware, um, our species tends to celebrate things uh, every five years uh, for some reason. I, I, I'm not exactly sure, like I get 50, I get 25, I get 75, but everybody loves a birthday. So I knew the 55th was coming up. So I do what we do. We made, we created the show that was designed to be the deepest dive ever into Star Trek. Um, I kind of pitched it like, um, you know, what's his name? Ken Burns. I'm like, what if Ken Burns did Star Trek? Mm. And by the grace of God, uh, History Channel liked it and we sold it to History Channel. I said, I'll rewrite it as long as Gene Roddenberry does not put word on paper. We are at each other's throats. It was just almost physically impossible for us to generate 26 episodes. I'd given up any hope of a marriage, any hope of having a, a child of my own. Spock dies in the second act? You gotta be kidding me. Well, this doesn't seem to be what we set out to do. You don't leave somebody out while everybody's talking about them. That just pisses them off. I always thought that we were in jeopardy. I mean, we went longer than the original series. Watch out. And when you get what we call spontaneous erections and you're wearing a onesie. I consider myself, it's funny, I say this to people and almost everybody thinks it's crazy. Um, I consider myself on a scale of one to 10 of Trekkie dumb, uh, like a 7.5. So I don't wear costumes. I don't know everything about everything. But the reason people always laugh at me when I say that is like my wife considers me a 10. But like people who are actually 10s, uh, they consider me like a four. So the way I, here's how I could explain it to you. Like the original series episode, I have like, uh, like a master's degree in that mm -hmm. uh the animated series episode i didn't even have first grade education the star trek 2 episode i had 89 phds deep space 9 master's degree voyager high school ged like so it's it's really all different for me and and like you know we did this episode that was only about star, technically starships, but really uh, Federation starships. And like that, I had a thousand PhDs in. So like, I actually learned a lot making the show. Cause like I said, like, for example, I didn't know anything about the animated series. Mm -hmm. If you read books about the making of Star Trek, her role is usually pretty well explained and, and usually very fairly. Mm -hmm. For some reason, the documentaries about the same period usually either don't mention her at all or barely mention her. And even if they do mention her, really left out the context of what she did. So, we actually did five years ago, the 50th anniversary of Star Trek, uh, also for History Channel, but it came out before the toys that made us. So we were on a much tighter leash. And I had opened that whole episode with a thing about Lucille Ball. And I was made to cut it out for various reasons, which, you know, again, it was fair. It was before toys that made us, whatever. If you watch the Star Trek episode of the toys that made us, you'll see kind of what I did in the History Channel thing that got cut. I put 
a very abbreviated version of it into the Star Trek toys that made us, but that episode was about toys. So I really couldn't get into it the way I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So this, this time, finally, I could do exactly what I wanted. And basically to make a long story short, what I wanted to do was basically say, hey, if you consider Gene Roddenberry to be the father of Star Trek, cool, that's fine. And that's accurate. But Lucille is as much the mother of Star Trek as Gene is the father. So that's what I tried to do. And to varying degrees, based on what I'm reading and social media and everything, it seems to have worked. Because even lifelong Trekkies are like, yeah, I didn't completely understand what she actually did. She was the one writing the checks. So what you always have to remember is like, and again, I'm not just like a documentarian. Like, I mean, I've been in show business over two decades. Like, I know what it's like to sell shows. I know how the business works. And like, what you have to understand is the same day Gene walked into Desilu with the script, there was 2,000 other writers walking into 2,000 other offices with 2,000 other scripts on the same day. So... There's a saying I heard when I was little, which is um, creativity without implementation is negligence. And so I've always assigned in my mind a lot of value to those who implement. And Gene could have written that script and it sat at the back of a drawer for the rest of his life. Lucille is the one who not only gave life which in our society requires money and in our business requires money that not Gene didn't have it. Every other network passed. So not only did she do that, but when NBC passed, and I, we put this in the episode, but I hope it was clear. When NBC passed on the first pilot, Lucille was out. They only covered about 70% of the budget. So Lucille, the day NBC declined to go to series, Lucille was already out about a hundred grand, which to you and me today would be about six or 700 grand. She wrote another check to write another pilot or to shoot another pilot. Like, so she didn't just like take a risk. She doubled down mm -hmm. on a risk. And the other thing I always think is worth mentioning is no one else was doing this. Like, the only other people following this business model were the networks. So you have NBC, CBS, and ABC. These are companies back in the 50s and 60s making hundreds of millions, which today would be billions. And here's Lucille with Desi, of course, but Desi was already kind of out of the picture by the time Star Trek started moving forward um, and Mission Impossible, by the way. But she's doing a business model that like only billion dollar corporations were following. So that's what I tried to do with the episode was give the context because it's very easy for people to think that Gene Roddenberry just had this completely straightforward, easy to follow path that led up to Star Trek getting on the air. And it was the opposite of that. Biophasers. Roddenberry, when the show was greenlit, was very, very aggressive at finding out what technology was on the way. So the best example and the most fun example to give you is the doors in Star Trek that would open automatically. The first supermarket in at least the United States was in Los Angeles that had those doors. And he saw that. And he was like, put that in the show. In the future, there's not gonna be doorknobs. He went to je the Jet Propulsion Lab and he was like, what's, more, what's better than lasers? And they're like, phasers. He's like, what would torpedoes be like in the future? They'll be made of lights. Like that's, he was so good about that. So the interesting thing is a lot of what's going on now, he kind of quote unquote foretold 
but he was like really grounding it in science before they even turned the camera on the first time. Um, the other thing that I always find very interesting that doesn't get talked about very often is the impact that Star Trek has had on architecture and design. There is one exception to what I said, and that actually is the transporter. It, it's a very cliched story, but they, the only reason they did the transporter was to save the money of the ship having to land. But the transporter is the one thing that I think scientists might not be trying to do if it wasn't for Star Trek. And like two years ago, they beamed an atom yes. from one side of a laboratory to another. Yes. So I do think that will affect humanity in a good way. And that is because of Star Trek. <laughs> I deliberately did not tell that story for two reasons. One, every documentary ever made about the original series covers that. But here's what they don't cover. And again, I just want to be clear, dude, I'm not shitting on any other documentaries. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is I wanted to do something different. Mm -hmm. So all the other docs always talk about this interracial kiss, the first interracial kiss and all that. So I didn't feel compelled to do it because it's been done before. But what I did feel compelled to do is who the f is Nichelle Nichols? Like, it, they, they never explain who she is. They never explain where she came from. Right. Like, so what we what I tried to do was show, Gene Roddenberry had done this other show about a police station in, in LA. That's where he met Leonard Nimoy. That's where he met Nichelle Nichols. And you can start to see all these pieces coming together almost a decade before they shot the, the second pilot, which Nichelle was in. So I really very consciously tried, and I did this with Toys That Made Us as well, where and movies that made us, where I always try to make sure our documentary will be complementary to all the other documentaries that have been made, but also make sure the story still makes sense to people that might not be familiar. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing. If you're not aware of this, this will blow your mind. That interracial kiss, it didn't happen. And this is another, yeah, exactly. This could have been a whole documentary by itself. They shot it two different ways. They shot it one way where they kissed and they shot it one way where they hugged. And it was still a very big deal for a, a, a black woman and a white guy to be hugging. Don't get me wrong. But the episode that aired, and this syndication, it was the kiss. The episode that aired was the hug. And if there was anybody who debated the racism of the era, all that blowback that your whole life you've probably been thinking was about a kiss was actually, dude, it wasn't even a hug. It was like an embrace. It was like, nice to meet you kind of thing. So all of that blowback, Alabama not airing the show, all of that stuff, dude, that was about a hug. That wasn't even about a kiss. But... There is an episode with Nichelle Nichols walking down a corridor, talking to a black guy, and that is most likely the first time ever that happened on national TV. And that, like, again, that simple act right. was groundbreaking. And it's so funny, like, people watching, you know, white people watching the show, which at the time was the majority of the people watching, right. like, they probably didn't even notice. Wow. But I'm sure you can guess who did notice. Boy, like, yeah. So that's not a thousand percent for sure, but it's 999% sure. That's the first time you saw a black woman and a black man walking down a hallway, just talking about regular shit and not like, you know, like whatever, like, like just two people that happen to be black walking down a hallway that probably hadn't happened. They offered me less money for Star Trek Three than Star Trek Two. I waved goodbye in the camera. And I went, oh, I think I'm done. I think I have to move on from the show. I said to my agent, get me out of this contract. Get me off the show. I'm just at Paramount trying to produce my first motion picture, and I get death threats. He said, we have a problem. Shatner hates the script. 
Oh, that's it. We're done. We're t- I did not do a single interview where I didn't have at least two or three medium to huge surprises. Kirstie Alley, which was like an hour and 50 minute interview. I mean, I think my jaw dropped seven or eight times just with her. We got Rick Berman. Like Rick Berman doesn't do interviews very often. Neither does Kirstie Alley. To the best of our knowledge, we did, she did, it's the second interview she's ever done about Star Trek. Um, but like just mind blowing, like Berman gave us so much information about the cancellation of enterprise, which was the end of the Berman era, which if you think about it really was the end of the Roddenberry era because Berman had overlapped with Roddenberry, JJ Abrams had not. So like we got so much that he had never told before and Kirstie Alley. I've conservatively seen Star Trek II probably 200 times. Like, dude, I'll never look at the movie the same way. Like, it was so much like, like, what? Yeah. Dude, it's always the same. The people you think will be hard or easy, the people you think will be easy will be hard. And the, the way you cheat it is you just start early and it just takes time. So like, I mean, Kirstie Alley, we actually shot her interview after that episode had locked and begged History Channel for like an extra week to get it in. Like, it, you, you never know. Like, we got, for movies that made us, this is always the, my favorite way to explain how it is to get interviews. We were trying to get Sigourney Weaver for a year. We did an episode about aliens. Mm-hmm. So we were trying to get her for a year and uh, couldn't get her. Then one of my best friends, other friends, was at a funeral that she was at. And he went up to her and got her to do the show. That's not it. That's not all. We interview Sigourney. It goes great. Interview's over. I'm like, Sigourney, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. And she goes, oh, my God, what a great interview. Thank you. How... How was Gail Ann Hurd's interview? And I go, you know, I gotta tell you, we she hasn't said yes yet. She goes, what? She picks up her phone, and I'm I'm literally watching this on Zoom. She calls Gail Ann Hurd while I'm watching, and is like, Gail, I just did a great interview for Aliens. How come you're not doing it? She hangs up, and then we got Gail. She looks at me and goes, Who else don't you have that you want? I go, uh, Carrie Hen. That's the woman who played the little girl. New. Yeah. yeah. Right. Literally called her right in front of me. Carrie, it's Sigourney. Why aren't you doing this show? It's the best interview I ever done about aliens. And then we were interviewing her two days later. May your journey be free of incident. <laughs>